All right, good to see you here tonight. Welcome to Common Ground. Just a couple things before we uh, begin. Um, I know the trip to Alhambra, that's in November. It's the Christmas uh, Christmas Carol. It's a offtake of what we know as a Christmas Carol. But anyway, that we have three tickets left. So um, they are uh, very few and, sh and far between here now. So if you want uh, to go and you haven't purchased a ticket yet, um, you have... Uh, there's three left, first come, first serve, so I'd encourage you to take part in that. Um, I would encourage you to get the bulletin, the prayer bulletin there for the prayer requests. In addition to that, we have um, a number of the announcements of things that are going on, whether it's a seasoned adult thing or, or whatever. I do know, um, just so you know, um, we are still needing some volunteers for Awana. I think the one uh, what was mentioned that Anne-Marie mentioned today was uh, a uh, music, what they, what'd she call teaching it? Teaching time. Teaching time. You know, they have the singing time and they jump around and all that. But they're not, we're not needing anybody to help with that, okay? You see, uh, but there is a teaching time and, and they basically hand you the lesson. So, I mean, it's all prepared. You might want to tweak it a little bit or whatever. It's a lot of object things and Philip said they made peanut butter sandwiches last week, is what he said. So he got a half a peanut. They're going to be shaking up colas, I believe. Shaking up colas, yeah. That concerned me, uh, being the administrator, and they're shaking colas up uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, that, to me, doesn't sound, that's a recipe for disaster right there. But anyway, Philip did last week, and he said uh, they made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or something, and he got a half a sandwich out of it, so... He didn't know how to make them? Well, I don't know about that. We won't go that far, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so they're needing someone to fill in there, either both sessions or maybe just one, and not to find somebody else to do the other one. So, But we're glad that you're here, and uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin uh, with our, uh, uh, Alan will lead us in music. God, thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. Um, We've been getting a lot of rain lately, Lord, and uh, we need that uh, refreshment on in the soil, and it cleans the air, and it does so much. And so, God, we just thank you for all that you do and what you give for, to us. Um, Lord, we, we had, do have several needs. So with COVID going around, there's a lot of, uh, of needs in this area, in this country, even this world, Lord, with, uh, with that pandemic that's still uh, with us now. And so, God, I pray that, that you would just um, use those who follow Christ to be examples uh, of your love and of your care for those around us. And um, with the events uh, that took place in Afghanistan, Lord, still many um, who are there, we think of the, um, of the people who are at the mercy of, of ruthless evil men. And Lord, um, beyond that even, we know of, of Christians who not only are in Afghanistan, but in other countries that are closed off, that are uh, run by dictators, um, that um, seek out to destroy Christianity. God, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who, who live in those countries, who face um, jail time, who face even death because of their walk, because of their belief in Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray for them. We ask that you would give them strength, discernment, and Lord, we pray that you thwart those efforts which would seek them out and, and cause them harm or, or even worse. And Father God, I just pray that you would uh, use the people in those areas to share their faith. And as we've seen uh, over and over, um, your church just explodes in countries like that. And so we pray for the Christians who are uh, in those countries, and we pray that um, they would not uh, be faint, they would not falter, that they would be bold in their witness and that we'd see many come to Christ, not only in those countries, but across this world. So God, we thank you this evening for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, as we offer our worship, I pray that it would be acceptable and received in your sight. We pray that each one of us would uh, sing with a love for you and express that love through our voice and through song. God, thank you for this evening. Speak to our hearts as we open your word. We just pray it all in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Alan, would you lead us? Amen. Well, uh, 
tonight, Yahweh and El Elyon. And uh, El so the El Barith. El Barith as well. So, yeah. Anybody know what that means? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll learn tonight. But uh, anyway, uh, I know what El Elyon means, and that, or at least how it translates out in the scriptures, is God Most High. And so, yes, God is exalted above all. He is above all. But at the same time, we can exalt him with our praise and lift him and mag lift him high and magnify his name. We're going to do that tonight with the songs that we sing. I'm so glad to have Sandy here next to me uh, playing for us. And so glad you're here. Let's sing together. Glorious is thy name. Thank you. 
got a listening guide. If you haven't got a listening guide, you can grab one right over there. There's also some prayer bulletins. I encourage you to do that. Not only you have a listing of people we pray for, not just in our church, but those uh, related to members of our church or members of our church who are in the ministry, and also those who uh, are in the service, military service. So I would encourage you to, to get those. Let me get situated here. <clears throat> Gotta be smart in the tools you work with. Here we go. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Oops. Here we go. All right. Now we're cooking. All right. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Yahweh. Do uh, does God have a proper name? A proper name? Most scholars believe that yes, he does, and that name is Yahweh, or Jehovah. Uh, and we're going to look at, briefly, 
uh, why Jehovah is the way it is, um, but we'll get to look at Jehovah later on in the coming weeks. Um, we're beginning to look at the different names of God tonight, and we begin with Yahweh, and I chose two other lesser names, and so they'll be a part, uh, take up the first part of what we're, we're talking about tonight, but we'll spend the majority of our time with the word Yahweh. Uh, compound names of God, the other two, and we'll look at compound names more in the coming weeks, so those des that describe God's character and activity, um, uh, we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, Yahweh, or sometimes Jehovah, occurs over 6,000 times in the Bible, the most often used name for God, sometimes tra translated as LORD, all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps. So let's uh, start out, as I said, with the, uh, the, um, the smaller names, not the smaller names, the less, lesser used names of God. And so the first one is El Elyon. Now from last week, do you recall what El meant? God, right, okay. It's the, uh, the Aramic word for God. I think the Arab, Arabic is El. Uh, it is also the Hebrew word for the one true God. So when El, when Elion is added to El, it's translated, as, as Alan said, God Most High, El Elion, God Most High. The term stresses God's strength, His sovereignty, supremacy. He is the framer and the possessor of all that we see, heaven and earth. And so what are some key passages from El Elion? The one is found in Genesis 14, referring to Melchizedek, and, and he brings out uh, an honoring uh, Abram. He brings out a bread and wine, a priest to God Most High. In Hebrew, that would be El Elyon. So we see it in Genesis. I'm not going to read through all these in the essence of time, but I wanted to include them so that you'd have it in your listening guide if you take it back and you want to look further into it. Another uh, place that we see uh, El Elyon is in Numbers 24. Uh, the sayings of God and has knowledge from Most High, Elyon. Okay, so we see it there in Deuteronomy. Chapter 32, when Most High, Elion, gave the nations their inheritance. So we see it in Deuteronomy, and then in Psalm 7, 17, I will thank the Lord for his righteousness. Now in some translations, that Lord is all caps. But then we, sing, we see here, at the, end of the, at the end of the verse here, the Lord Most High, El Elion. Okay? And then one other verse here, Psalm 78. They remembered that God was their rock, the Most High God. I guess if you were literally uh, translating that, it would be Elion El, their most high God, but you see what I'm saying. That's three or that's a few passages uh, where uh, El Elion is specifically mentioned in Scripture. From a historical standpoint, well, let me go back here. Sorry about that. Uh, the name of God was first used, as I said, by Melchizedek, El Elion, when he blessed Abraham or Abram at the time. Uh, these early occurrences, um, after the earlier occurrences, we see there was a brief time uh, about a thousand, up until about 1000 BC until El Elyon was used again, and then it was used in poetic and exilic uh, literature, and you see some of those, Psalm 9-2, Dan 7-18, uh, Dan 7-22, 25, and 27. Okay, that's El Elyon. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these two. And you'll see why in a second. The next one is El Berith. Okay? Um, it's translated God of the Covenant. Uh, the root word of, the, of covenant means to eat together. So it's a bringing together. All right? A couple key passages where we see El Berith. Now, I've got to warn you here, and you'll see as we read. Um, well, let's just get into it. Judges 8. When Gideon died, the Israelites turned and prostituted themselves by worshiping the Baals and made Baal Berith their god. Okay? And look at Judges 9. Uh, when all the citizens of the Tower of Shechem heard, they entered the inner chamber of the temple of El Berith. Now, let me give you a little context here, historical context. I almost didn't include this name here because it's generally looked at as a god that was worshipped at, at the temple of Shechem, as noted uh, in the verses that we just looked at. Uh, but in ancient manuscripts, El Berith is usually, it's usually identified with Baal Berith, which is a god of, the, of Baal worshippers. 
Although it can be argued that Baalbereth and Elbereth are not identical, and that Elbereth, as noted in Judges 9.46, that you see on the screen there, is a reference to the Hebrew god, Yahweh. So we'll leave it at that. It's a very minute um, reference um, to a, a name of God, but I did want to include it, uh, but we'll move on, okay? We want to look at the main uh, name that we're going to look at tonight, and that is, uh, hang on a minute here, here we go, uh, Yahweh, all right? As we look at this important name of God, we must first look at its translation that begins by looking at the spelling. Now, we got to discuss this here. Um, it's the tetragrammaton. Uh, that is the Greek word for four letters. Yahweh is the given name for God in the Bible, and when it stands alone in Hebrew, it uh, is written with, with the English letters Y-H-W-H, okay? Y-H-W-H. And this uh, is, in this form it appears, as I said, 6,000 times in the Bible. Uh, the exact number is debated, and we're going to get to that in just a second. The word Adonai appears in the Masoretic text as a title, and it's a substitute for the personal name of God, Yahweh. Now, why? As you know, maybe you don't know, but in uh, ancient Hebrew, there were only consonants. There are no vowels. No vowels. The pronunciation of the words was transmitted in a separate Hebrew oral tradition. So someone who studied the language in ancient uh, Hebrew, they, if they understood ancient Hebrew, they didn't need the vowels. They understood where the vowels were placed and how to pronounce the word. Jewish scholars called the Masoretes were charged with maintaining and producing the Hebrew Bible, what we now know as the Old Testament. Now keep in mind that Jews don't call their Bible the Old Testament. I don't know if you knew that or not. They don't refer to the Scriptures as the Old Testament. Why? To them, there is only one Testament, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. That's Psalms and Songs of Solomon. Um, they don't recognize the New Testament as from God. But for argument's sake, we will refer to these writings as the Old Testament because we do recognize the New Testament and so we will add, refer to it as the Old Testament. So anyway, the Masoretes developed standards in their text writing so that there would be consistent and understandable ways to write and speak Hebrew. There were three main components. There were the letters, as we talked about, there were only the consonants, okay? There were the vowel signs, and they were little symbols, and accents. You know, every word has an accent. If it has several syllables, there's an accent or where one syllable is emphasized over others. So, the Masoretes began to add vowel symbols to the Hebrew manuscripts sometime before the 10th century to help folks pronounce the Hebrew words. Remember also that Hebrew scribes, religious leaders, were, they so revered God's name, they would refuse to pronounce the word Yahweh. And let's talk about that for a minute, the pronunciation of Yahweh. The original pronunciation of Y-H-W-H is not known. We say Yahweh, but we don't really don't know. As I said, Hebrew people so revered the name, they wouldn't even utter it, even when reading Scripture. So to preserve the sanctity of the name and allow readers to identify the name of God as they read, the Masoretes placed the vowel letters of Adonai under the consonants of Y-H-W-H. This common substitution technique clued the readers to pronounce the word Y-H-W-H as Adonai. So when they saw that with the, the Adonai vowels, the, the Hebrew consonants Y-H-W-H with the vowels from Adonai, they would know to pronounce it Adonai. Does that make sense? Because they didn't want to say Yahweh. They revered it so much. In cases which Adonai already appears, they would also add the word Elohim. So instead of accidentally pronouncing the name of Yahweh, however it was pronounced, the technique led the reader produce the produce Lord Adonai or God Elohim. 
So as a result, the consonants in the original text remained, but the original pronunciation was eventually lost. We don't have the original pronunciation. Just what we think it may have been, which may or may not be accurate. It is a scholarly, scholarly guess at best. To add further confusion, the form Jehovah in the Bible results from reading the consonants of the Tetragrammaton with the vowels of the surrogate word Adonai. Now, there was a man by the name of uh, Petrus Galatinus, Galatinus, who in 1518 transliterated the four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, with the Latin letters, J-H-V-H. He made a mistake. And then used the three vowel pointers of Adonai. And so it produced the artificial form of what we see now, Jehovah. You see it on the screen? J-H-V-H with the three pointers, the vowel, uh, the vowel pointers of Adonai. So, and we're going to look at Jehovah a little later on. I just wanted to just briefly talk about it. Um, when in Scripture did we, were we introduced with the name of God, Yahweh? It's found in Genesis 2.4 in conjunction with Elohim. And we're going to study Elohim later, and so we'll cover Genesis 2-4 at a later point in time. Um, in Genesis 28, we read of Jacob's dream at Bethel, and Yahweh is used again with Elohim. The meaning of the name Yahweh is, is used in both these places in Genesis really gives us no clear answer as to its pronunciation. In both instances, though, we can confirm that Yahweh and Elohim refer to the same God. The Bible clearly teaches that there is one true God. Look at Isaiah 43. You are my witnesses. This is the Lord's declaration. And my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No God was formed before me, and there will be none after me. Clearly, not only in this verse, but in other verses, there is only one true God. The prophet Isaiah proclaimed that fact. What about the significance of the name Yahweh? And a lot of what we understand of the meaning of Yahweh is found in Exodus chapter 3. It gives us a glimpse to the word Yahweh, and it tells us a lot about God. Look at it, Exodus 3.14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. The name Yahweh is long thought to be a form of the verb Hey, yay, which means to be. From there, we'll understand that Yahweh comes from that root and gives us the theological understanding of God as one who is, who exists, or who causes existence. Thus, we see that God is self-existence, existent. Only Yahweh possesses life and permanent existence. The notion of God who is, carries more meaning than the present tense. It refers to the covenant name of God, and I am who I am, which can also be rendered, I will be who I will be, or maybe also, I create whatever I create. Yahweh alone is God, and there are none before him, and without him, there is no life. Nothing exists except that has life, through him. Until we know him, we can never fully understand our purpose as a human being or as a human race. So let's talk about the introduction of the word Yahweh, the revelation. In Exodus chapter 3, a very important passage in understanding the name of Yahweh. As you may remember, the children of Israel went to Egypt because of what? You remember? Famine. So they went there to get food. Uh, and then eventually, what happened to the Jewish people? They became slaves, right, to the Egyptian people. For generations, they cried out to God for deliverance. And then God chose who? Moses to bring deliverance to his people. And he confronted Moses at a bush that was burning, but was not consumed by the fire. When Moses approached the bush, God spoke to Moses and told him that he was standing 
on holy ground. Let's pick it up in, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 6 and 8. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I, uh, I know about their sufferings, and I have come down to rescue them for, for, from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, Hethites, uh, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jezebites, and all the other rites, okay? God identified himself as the God of Israel's forefathers. No doubt, Moses probably knew the stories that were told of how great God was and how he showed his greatness, the supernatural activity he performed among his chosen people and how he interacted with those uh, men of God. The same God was now speaking to Moses in the present tense. God told Moses how he cared for and sustained his people in the past. And now he was telling Moses he was going to do the same thing in the present by delivering his people from the Egyptians. Look at verses 10 and 11. Therefore go, I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So God tells Moses that he was selected to be God's instrument for deliverance of his people. Moses was less than thrilled <laughs> to be selected and tried very hard to get out of the assignment. By asking God, who am I? Moses asked an irrelevant and an irreverent question. Because God had already promised that he would use Moses to deliver the people. It was irreverent because it questioned the nature and the intelligence of God and his judgment. Moses gave his feeble excuses of why he could not do what God commanded, but in reality, it was the one who was created questioning and arguing with his creator. God revealed himself, and he revealed himself as being active, not only in the past, but also in the present. To Moses, God was a God of history until God intentionally encountered him in the present at the burning bush. Moses could very well have believed all the accounts of how God interacted with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, yet when Moses encountered God in the present, he struggled to believe that God of the history could work through his life to deliver Israel from the Egyptians. So Moses asked the second question. If I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. We read that last verse before. Now, the second question that Moses asks is both relevant and reverent. It is a question that should be our focus in the present. God answered this question. He said, tell them, I am has sent me to you. This is my memorial name for all generations. Without getting too deep in the woods, or weeds, I should say, from the Hebrew word study, the stem of the Hebrew word and the tense denote an action that had a starting point in the past, continues in the present, and is not yet complete. It's going to continue into the future. Thus, we can read it as, I am who I am, or even, I am who I've always been. It means that the same God that was speaking from the burning bush was the same God that worked in the lives of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. It also implies that, the, that God had the ability and the desire to work through Moses in the present and into the future. In any case, we understand that God is self-existent and he is eternal. I think another point we want to see in this, in this, uh, this 
chapter of, of Exodus that God is righteous and he is holy. The name Yahweh underscores that. Look at Psalm 11. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright will see his face. Daniel also speaks to the fact of his righteousness and holiness. Look at Daniel 9.14. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous and all he has done. But we have not obeyed him. And then one final uh, passage is found in Leviticus chapter 19. Speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So in Leviticus we see that God is holy and calls us to that same holiness. We need to understand that our sin is not a violation of man's standards. We look at uh, crimes that are committed. Let's pick murder, for example. The crime of murder is not a, a, uh, it's not a, a, a conviction or a violation of the law uh, that we have here in this country against capital murder. It is a violation, a sin against God's righteousness. Our lives and our sin are put up against the holiness of God. That's the standard that we face. God's standard, holiness. That's the standard that we should be compared with. But Yahweh doesn't stop there. Look at Jeremiah 31. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faith, faithful love to you. That's some fantastic news in Scripture. and We see it in other places in Scripture. That even though God condemns sin, and we as sinners are condemned to hell, He still loves us. He still loves us in spite of our sin. Amazing love, how can it be that my, that my God would die for me in my sin? And that leads us to the last point here. He is a God of redemption. That's the great news. He, now, he acted on his love for us to bring it away, for us once again to relate to him. Going back to Exodus 34, let's read again here. Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshipped. And God responded to Moses' humbleness and his bowing down and worship. Look at verse 10. Look, I am making a covenant. In the presence of all your people, I will perform wonders that have never been done in the whole earth or in any nation. All the people you live among will see the Lord's work. For what I am doing with you is awe-inspiring. God declares that he came down to deliver or redeem Israel. In verse 10, he commissions Moses to go to Pharaoh to release his people from captivity. That same message of redemption, of deliverance, is true for us today. Later in chapter 34, we read of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. The second time. <laughs> what happened to the first set? <laughs> he broke them in anger, right? Look at... Um, Verses 6 and 7 out of chapter 34. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children. Notice that God connects his attributes, his judgment of sin, and his promise of forgiveness in this one passage. God is holy, and by his nature, he must condemn sin. Some would argue that, you know, really, if God was a loving God, he would never condemn sinners. They missed the point. God must condemn sin because it affects it effectively destroys his image in us. God hates that which would tarnish him, and we were created in God's image. That's both intolerable and impossible for God to do. God can't just wink at sin, at sin and say, ah, forget it, come on in. God can't do that. It's against his nature. It's impossible for him to do. He created human beings in his image, without sin. We chose wrongly. 
We sinned, and that tarnished us, and that caused the divide between us and God. We died. Death is separation. And because of sin, we died. We were separated from God. But God knew that we would do that even before he created the first human. He provided a way to cover sin, a way to make humans righteous again. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. After he says above, you did not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He then says, see, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sin. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. What animal blood could not do, the blood of Christ accomplished. His sacrifice paid the debt of sin in full. All sin, before his death, that's Christ's death, all sin since then, all sin that's present today and even tomorrow, and the next day and the next day until he ends this age, is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So what can we take from this knowledge of Yahweh? and apply it to our lives. The first thing, God is eternally faithful. He has always existed. He will continue to exist throughout eternity. His covenants are immovable. His word is his bond. He promises, uh, his promises can be taken to the bank because God never fails. Never fails. He never bounces a check. Just as he was faithful to the saints of old, he will be faithful to you. Moses questioned God when God told him to go to Egypt. Before we condemn Moses, okay, don't we do the same thing if we're really honest with ourselves? We are called to teach a class, maybe. We feel the nudge to witness to a friend, to serve in a ministry. Our reply is, who am I, God? I don't have the right words to say to some. I know they need to know Jesus, but I don't know, I don't know what to say. God, I'm not really a teacher. How could I teach children? How could I listen to those in Awana? We say the same thing as Moses did. Are we not guilty of making all kinds of excuses as to our inability? When God is telling us, just like he told Moses, I will use you because I've called you to use you, I'm not going to let you fail. Who is this God we claim to worship? Is he almighty or not? Is he faithful or not? That's the questions we need to ask ourselves. We may question our abilities, but God looks beyond that. He can overcome any issues that we face, even our inabilities. If he calls us, he can use us. Secondly, God is holy. That's his nature. He went, will not and cannot change. He is perfect in every way. There's nothing imperfect about him, nor will he accept anything less than perfection. God hates imperfection. He hates sin. He hates anything that goes against his nature and his holiness. He created a perfect world, including human beings, which were perfect. In fact, they were created, as we said, in God's own image. We were. We weren't God's. But, but as being created in his image, humans have an eternal soul. We have the ability to make choices, but we chose wrongly. We chose against God. We've all sinned. Romans tells us that. All have sinned. Because of that, God cannot accept us. 
Because he hates sin. He doesn't hate us. He hates sin. And to accept something unclean and sinful would go against his very nature. Would go against his holiness. His call for us is to be holy. He desires the best for us because he loves us. And anything less than the best is unacceptable. Therein lies the problem. It is a sin problem that separates us from God. It is not of his choosing, but of ours. But there's good news in all of that. God is relational and loving. His love is so deep and vast, he was compelled to make a way, a bridge, that would cross the separation between us and himself. He provided the perfect lamb to die. It was himself who took on the form of his creation. He took on the form of a human in the person of Jesus to pay the death penalty that we are all guilty of. But we got to accept the gift. A gift left unopened is not, is not, um, will not work. When we readily accept the gift, there's the next question. How do we see God? Moses knew God of his forefathers. He heard the oral accounts, God working in the patriarchs of the past. To Moses, God was a God of the past. Unfortunately, many of us as Christians are at the same point in our walk. We've seen God work in people's lives. We've heard all the stories. We understand and we believe in the historical accounts of, of God parting the Red Sea, of providing a Noah an ark so that um, he could save and house two of every kind so that the animal kingdom could replenish after the flood. But if I asked you right now, if you believe that God could use you to work through your life today, would you believe it? Can he? Do you believe that God could use you to work in your church to change this city? Do you think he could use you to change this nation or this world? Do you believe that God can use you to change marriages, restore broken relationships? Maybe those, one of those marriages or broken relationships is yours. Can God use you to teach Sunday school? Can he use you to serve in the flood or food or the clothing ministry? Can God use you to help with a WANA or a MOPS ministry? Can God use you to witness to a friend who is lost? There are many ways that God wants to use you and can use you. Is God merely a God of history and not really a God of the present in your life? God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. You've heard that probably. I'm sure you've heard that. God is relational. He is loving. He has a plan for your life and to use you in service to him. He is a covenantal God who is faithful to complete anything that he promises. The question and challenge is to put that understanding to use in your life. He desires to use you in changing this world. He will give you everything that you need to do that which he's called you to do. He's a big God who does big things. Not human-sized things. God-sized things. He doesn't need you to do them. But he desires to allow you to be a part of what he wants to do and what he's going to do in this world in advancing his kingdom. The big question is will you trust him at his word? and his invitation to join him as he advances his kingdom. He's faithful. He's holy. He's loving. He wants that relationship with you. Will you respond? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this first, or actually second meeting, but the first word that we studied uh, related to uh, who you are. And we see this is your proper name, Yahweh. We don't really know what, how it's pronounced, and we see that there maybe it was a mistake in, in coming up with Jehovah and, and replacing the word Yahweh so that they didn't have to say it. But 
no matter what the word is, that doesn't change who you are. You are God Almighty. You are a holy God. You are a God that has eternally existed. There's been no beginning to you and there will be no end. You created all that is, all that will ever be. And Lord, your desire is to relate to us. You are a loving, relational God. Even in spite of your holiness and our lack of holiness, you provided a way that we might relate to you through Jesus Christ. God, as we embrace that, that your very nature, as we come to Christ and we relate to you, help us, God, to see that you desire to use us. You have a plan for our lives. You don't need us to accomplish that plan, but you want to use us. God, will we be found faithful in responding to your call on our lives, that you, we would allow you to work in our lives to carry out that which you've set before us. God, we can become concerned, afraid, but I pray we would never question who you are and your ability to get accomplish what you want done as Moses did. And truthfully, Lord, as we often do, may we see you uh, and your call upon our lives as something that we can respond to and put it all in your hands. Allow us, Lord, to be your willing servants, I pray, in the days ahead as they draw close to your return. My prayer is in Jesus' name. Amen.